And it always seemed to me like the evangelical egalitarian or evangelical feminist position was bringing in something from feminist philosophy, so some sort of foreign element. And I resented that foreign element. I was like, okay, that's corrupting your thinking. I don't care whether something is foreign. <laughs> I care whether, whether it's alien or hostile. Um, hmm. So I, I guess I'd say bring the world into that biblical framework and test it. Yes. Because, you know, the, the world was created by God too, not just scripture. God is in the world, not just in the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to The Flanner and the Philosopher. I'm your host, Joel Carini, resident philosopher and writer at The Natural Theologian. My co-host is King Laugh, uh, our resident flaneur, and very pleased to have our guest this week, uh, Dr. Nigel Bigger. Dr. Bigger is the uh, Regis Professor Emeritus of Moral Theology at the University of Oxford, and the author of many books, including most recently, Colonialism, A Moral Reckoning, and uh, uh, In Defense of War, one that I recently read and, and wrote about. And so thanks for being here, Dr. Bigger. Uh, thanks, Joel, for having me on. I look forward to our conversation. Yes. Thank, thank you for uh, taking a break from only the subject of colonialism to discuss uh, theological method. I don't know how many uh, online newsletters there are about theological method, but that is central to <laughs> what I'm currently writing at my Substack, The Natural Theologian. And I, I, there's a lot uh, of fruitful terrain here to cover. So I just wanted to open with something I wrote and then something you wrote. So in my um, an essay I wrote to, to be the introductory essay to my book, The Natural Theologian, I wrote this about um, evangelical theology being based solely on the Bible. Uh, I've come to a, a particular conclusion about the limitation of Bible-only theology, that uh, evangelicals have neglected the role of natural human knowledge in their theology. And the fact that experience plays a role in theology is the reason for different interpretations of scripture. Correctly, but in an unexamined way, thought and experience are influencing different theological formulations. In short, if you pretend that experience or empirical information isn't getting in there, it gets in there anyway. Then I read in your uh, In Defense of War, the following. You were discussing um, Richard Hayes and his pacifist theology. And you said, Hayes himself brings more empirical data and brings it more deeply into his exegetical and synthetic work than he himself recognizes. He, he imports empirical assumptions about anger and violence as necessarily vengeful and malevolent. I do not complain at all about the importation. I merely dissent from the assumptions. So this idea um, that experience plays a role in theology, um, could you expand upon that to get us started? Uh, yes, Joel. I, I mean, on the one hand, um, Orthodox Christians, evangelical Christians are right to think that um, biblical tradition um, tells us things that general experience won't give us. I mean, it uh, tells us the story of the people of Israel um, culminating in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, the, the, this is a particular history, and this particular history uh, reveals certain things about God, about how human beings should relate to God, about our uh, uh, the context of, of human existence. Um, so there are things that particular traditions, and in, in this case, the biblical tradition, uh, tells us that we won't find elsewhere. Um, at least not so explicitly, not so directly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I guess I guess I'd, I'd I'd make a distinction here between, as it were, particular experience, which uh, a tradition um, 
conveys and, and general experience, which, which everyone has of the common world we live in. Mm. Um, um, with regard to Richard Hayes, um, what I was pointing out was, was a, a narrower point, namely that uh, when, when um, Christians use moral concepts like anger or love, um, uh, they often uh, um, make assumptions about, let's say, anger. Um, and let's say lots of people think that uh, anger is always wrong and anger is always, uh, always necessarily leads to violence, for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, reflection on human experience might tell us that actually there are different kinds of anger. Uh, some anger can be completely out of control. Uh, some anger um, um, many of us will have experienced can lead us to abuse other people. Um, but not all anger is out of control. And uh, a certain, we, we might have intuited that a certain resentment of injustices done to us or to other people is appropriate. And if we are Christians and we, are, we regard the Bible as an authority, we might notice... <laughs> that in certain passages of the Gospel of Matthew, for example, um, Jesus becomes incandescently angry against the Pharisees. Hmm. Um, so there's, a, there's a kind of, you know, to and fro between reflection on one's own experience and the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's an interesting one uh, because I don't want to get stuck on the anger example. However, King Laugh and I have had a, ongoing discussion about the place of, of anger, whether it has any place in, in, in the Christian life um, for different reasons. But it's an interesting thing because usually the, the attempt is to make the argument solely from the Bible. And um, though even there you can find biblical <clears throat> witness, chiefly people point to be angry and do not sin. Um, at least, yes, that's one, that's one main passage. On the other hand, there are a lot of vice lists in the New Testament where anger and rage appear just as, you know, vices to be avoided in con yeah. contrast to the fruit of the spirit. So there, there is, to me, that, that, that is itself like an opening to, to get, dig into the actual phenomena of anger. Cause, because sometimes biblical, evidence doesn't immediately give an obvious conclusion on, on one side. Yeah. Or not. yeah. yeah. I think I've heard I, a I, distinction that Dr. Bigger is making, and I'd like to see if, if this is accurate of your position, that the Bible is a particular tradition. So when we approach the Bible, we're not necessarily approaching a book of, of magic uh, propositions. We're, we're approaching the same kind of organic material that we would in an ethicist. Uh, the conviction that we have is that it is inspired by God. That you know that there is uh, perhaps a, a greater precision, accuracy, value, um, but that it isn't a different kind of thing. And when you approach it as uh, be angry, do not do not sin, as this this sort of meme rather than as a, an organic part of the, the, the history and the development of ethics within the, the Hebrew people, that you end up in this place where you, you don't quite know how to handle it. You don't have the same skills and education that you might in handling other ethical. Yes. I mean, I think that um, the, the Bible is, is a, is a, special tradition, uh, Christians regarded as authoritative because it tells certain important truths. Um, so in that sense, it is it is special. Um, not every tradition tells truths, or not these truths. Um, um, but then going back to what Joel was saying, you know, some people think we should only take our cue from the Bible. And uh, my view is, well, yes, but... Um, Assumptions we make about certain human phenomena like anger um, can lead us to overlook what 
the Bible tells us, because the Bible, uh, as we know, um, is a collection of 60 different books of different kinds of literature uh, uh, with various provenances and um, expanding about a thousand years in terms of times of origin. Um, so, uh, um, like any tradition, like any living tradition, it's not homogeneous. I mean, there are there are different voices there, and they don't always obviously concur. Um, and uh, the danger is, if we take our cue from one bit of the Bible, uh, we might assume that uh, anger is always wrong. Um, but, uh, for example, I, in my own experience, um, uh, as, as a Christian, um, felt that I was bound to eschew all anger uh, in a certain case hmm. and discovered I couldn't because injustice was being done again and again and again. And I came to the conclusion, actually, it's better... Actually, if someone's doing something wrong, whether to you or someone else, um, <laughs> resentment if you like, we can use different words, anger, resentment, hostility to the bad that is being done is surely appropriate. Um, so um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, you may think, you just think you cue from the Bible, uh, but actually um, um, your own experience can, as it were, open your eyes to what is in the Bible. So, you know, given my experience perhaps of justified anger, uh, when I come across, I think it's in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, um, those passages where Jesus, addressing the Pharisees, say, you know, says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, you can hear the anger. Now, uh, I, you know, I suspect if I hadn't uh, uh, come to that conclusion about anger out of my own experience, I might not have been... I, I might not have noticed that passage in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So I, there is a dialogue between... The text and the human being here, I think. Yeah, I do think there's an attempt to make it only one way sometimes. Uh, this is most obvious maybe in like creation evolution debates where there's at least a large contingent of American evangelicals who don't want any information from the sciences or experience in that sense to influence the interpretation. But But the interplay sort of happens no matter what, I mean, even if you take the six day creation view, you end up trying to you know, figure out how to jerry rig the fossils into your own story there. But the other example I wanted to bring up uh, was from King Laugh and my uh, education where the, the evangelical uh, complementarian egalitarian debate was very live. And it was, it was being carried on purportedly on exclusively biblical grounds. And this always seemed, it didn't quite make sense to me. You know, I, I leaned on the complementarian side, aka the side that took the wives submit to your husbands, you know, the marriage stuff more literally, but also the only men, uh, I do not permit a woman to preach, First Timothy and all that. Uh, so for church office as well. And it always seemed to me like the evangelical egalitarian or evangelical feminist position was bringing in something from feminist philosophy, so some sort of foreign element. And I resented that foreign element. I was like, okay, that's corrupting your thinking. But I've, I've shifted because now I think if, you're, if, if the evangelical feminist brings a premise from experience, like male authority is almost always abusive in some way. Um, or exemplary of, of patriarchy. And your only response to that is, I have a Bible verse here. <laughs> well, it doesn't <laughs> prove anything. That they already knew that Bible verse was there, and that kind of just proves that Paul was a, was a patriarch. And so what you actually need to do is move on to the territory of philosophy and experience and question those empirical, or, 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 or deal with them. Like, what percentage, or, or in what ways can male authority be prone to these vices? And is the whole history of, you know, Christian uh, male 
patriarchy and then other other forms of Christendom exemplary of of those vices. So it seems to me that that's what you're doing clearly in, in colonialism, in, in a sense, though it's not exclusively about Christian theology. But yeah. what, is, what is your take on that? Well, just on, on this issue of the relation between the, between the sexes, um, um, I think, yeah, uh, so on the one hand, um, um, I, I think, generally speaking, uh, Scripture gives us, um, as, it, as it were, basic theological principles, a, a view of God, a view of the world in relation to God and human being in relation to God, uh, that provide, as it were, the parameters, and also provides basic moral principles. Um, mm -hmm. And I think within that framework, and, and since we, we have to, it's, um, I don't care whether something is foreign, <laughs> I care whether, whether it's alien or hostile. Um, mm. So I, I guess I'd say bring the world into that biblical framework and test it. Yes. Because, you know, the, the world was created by God too, not just Scripture. And God is in the world, not just in the Bible. Hmm. And uh, therefore, if you like, we need to we need to, te to test the spirits here. And it may be something in God's world will open the text of Scripture to us. Hmm. Uh, but we have to, as it would put it, in dialogue. Um, now, on the issue of the relationship between the sexes, um, I mean, I. I I, I, I've pretty quickly came to a, a, an egalitarian point of view. Hmm. Why? Well, because, you know, within the whole um, body of Scripture, uh, you get um, different, as it were, um, elements. Um, I mean, there is, in, in the Gospels and in, in the epistles of Paul, there are strong elements of... Um, relational equality, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, famously Galatians three twenty eight. Um, I often quote uh, that that passage from um, the uh, Book of Revelation where uh, um, Jesus says, "Open the door, um, uh, and it, it, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, um, I will sit down and." and you will eat with me, and I with you. There's a, there's a kind of equality there, mm -hmm. um, and and then um, if you put, uh, and Paul does maintain a certain uh, sexual hierarchy, um, but then uh, even that has a kind of equalizing trajectory in the way that, uh, let's say, Roman or, or Greek. Um, Conventions did not have so yes, uh, um, the, the man is uh, is is head of the wife, and yet <laughs> the Christian man, the Christian head, must love his wife as Christ loves the church. Um, it reminds me very much of, of the way in which Paul deals with slavery, uh, the letter to Philemon. So what's happened is um, Onesimus has run away from his master. Philemon runs to Paul. Uh, Paul tells Philemon to go back, excuse me, Onesimus to go back to Philemon. Uh, so in that sense, he, he, as it were, respects the institution of um, um, slavery, the master-slave relationship. The slave is the property of the master, um, which doesn't sound very good to us. Sure. But then he says, but then he sends back with, with uh, I guess, Onesimus to Philemon, the letter, which says, here's your slave back. If you're a Christian, you must treat your slave as a beloved brother. Mm -hmm. Well, just ask yourself, what remains of slavery when masters treat slaves in that fashion? So I see Paul as, I mean, in a sense, like many of us, he's trapped by, to some extent, by um, the cultures we were brought up in. But he puts in motion forces that are actually quite revolutionary. Mm -hmm. he, hasn't got, he, hasn't, he hasn't got to the end yet, but they're at work. So there's that. So, so the, the text itself is more complicated and dynamic than some people think. But then, just going back to my own experience in on this matter, um, I'm married. I've been married to my wife for 39 years. Um, um, 
the, the notion of, of, of my being, as it were, constitutionally or structurally or nominally the head of our relationship just makes no empirical sense to me at all, uh, in, be, be, simply because um, uh, I'm competent to do some things, my wife is more competent to do other things. We, we're constantly sharing back and forth. Um, and so, so just, you know, at this point, you know, uh, I, I just have to say to St. Paul, when he affirms the hierarchy, I just don't get it. <laughs> hmm. And by the way, and by the way, you know, elsewhere, Paul, you, you, you said these things, which doesn't quite square with what you're saying here. So, but, but there is a kind of negotiation again, between experience and the text, but, it, but here's, here's the thing. A lot of evangelicals think, you know, if you, if you regard experience as an authority, you are, as it were, just dismissing the text. Mm -hmm. That's that's not what's happening here. Right. Um, I, I'm testing my experience against the text, and the text against my experience. So it's not it's not simply a dismissal either of the text or of my experience. So yeah. one of the great insights of your book, to me, um, one, one of the great insights. Yes, sorry, <laughs> of your most recent book. I just assume that's what we're talking about. Um, it's like a talk show, uh, you know, uh, promoting books. But yes, please. The the to me, one of the great insights of the Bible is that God takes us as children and reveals things when we are ready to have those revealed. And one one of the things that I think drove empire was the idea uh, of the value. Uh, of all men and women, and that we should try to bring them into the good things that we have discovered, the good things that we have cultivated, that they're to be shared. Uh, but that dropping that in people's laps immediately and without any kind of parameters or, or boundaries is almost as destructive as not ever giving it to them. Um, and so this this idea that you know, as societies develop, I mean, we see this with, with how God, the dispensations of his interactions with his people, that that is also the case with our civilizations. I mean, you go from everyone might work on the farm or, you know, in an aristocratic setting, you know, some might fight, some might pray, uh, to now you are in a position where uh, us suburban communities do not have a bunch of people working in the home. You You essentially have the, the workplace, and then there's this place everyone eats and sleeps. So if you are one of a hundred people and your wife stays home to care for the home that has all these labor saving devices and she's alone, that's a very depressing place to be. And, the, and there's not, so what I see is there's, there's some men who want to be better Jews. You know, they, they just want to carry on as, as things have been denying the changes uh, to society, which, drove empire to come to places that were less developed. We we have developed these things. The world is not as it once was. You know, just uh, nomadic herding of, of animals is probably not going to, to leave you with very much or, or is going to cause conflict with others. There, there seems to be a denial. And on the other hand, there's, there's a sort of over-realized eschatology that I think in many cases, and in the case of colonialism, thinks that if there is any beyond where we currently are, that where we currently are is an evil in itself. It's an oppression that, that in fact, the, the things that are like scaffolding to build the cathedral are evil because they aren't the cathedral in its finished state. So what would you say is a good way for, you know, because I think you wrote this book in some ways to 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 give a purpose and a drive and a meaning and a, a kind of appropriate pride in in the West and its accomplishments to carry on to to do something and not just sort of be sad, defeated, yeah. and and yeah. commit you know harakiri. You know, what would you say that is? What does that look like? Soaking laugh. Uh, you you touch on a on a very important feature of of the book. Um, which is, uh, and this uh, this is um, this is shaped by my Christian view of humanity. Um, I regard human beings as creatures; we're not gods. We are bound by time. Um, we learn, uh, but whatever we learn, we, we we never reach perfect knowledge. We're always learning and growing. 
And none of us, not even St. Paul, <laughs> uh, gets to the end, capital E. Um, and so looking back in history, uh, we see our ancestors doing things that are poorless, enslaving other people, slaughtering other people. Um, and we can, as many progressive people do now, adopt a very moralistic stance and, and um, damn our wicked, uh, usually white, ancestors for the nasty things they did. Um, uh, just forgetting that, of course, we, the progressive judges, we too are sinners, we're not gods, and um, at the very least, um, um, we should be aware of the fact of sin and moral flaws and moral ignorance within ourselves right now, because we can be sure that future generations will look upon us as we now look upon the past. And one of the features about what I'm calling the, the kind of progressive, or to use the, the popular term, woke uh, judgment about the past is a colossal arrogance and a colossal lack of humility, which I find profoundly um, unchristian. Um, um, but looking, you know, looking at the past, um, and I discuss this in 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 my book. Uh, it seems to me that in in uh, first of all in um, Northwest Europe and also in New England in the late seventeen hundreds, there was a kind of moral revolution. Uh, more and more people came to regard slave trading and slavery as abominable, and they did so partly inspired by the Christian conviction that all people are fundamentally equal under God, regardless of race and regardless of cultural development. Um, and that was a, a change in mores that led to the movements to abolish slavery in uh, Britain, elsewhere in Europe, and also in, in New England. Um, for various reasons, at a certain point in history, we woke up uh, to what was happening. Um, and, and yes, um, Thereafter, the, in the British Empire, after slavery was abolished, slave trading and slavery abolished in the early 1800s, uh, the empire used its imperial power to uh, suppress slave trading and slavery all over the world from Brazil, across Africa, India, Australasia. And um, um, uh, the British uh, thought that they were doing uh, the world a favour in abolishing slavery. Uh, now, of course, slave traders and slave masters weren't always very happy with that, uh, with that uh, um, colonial intrusion. But you can be damn sure the slaves were happy with it. <laughs> um, not all, you know, not, not all non-white peoples think the same thing. Why on earth would you suppose they do? Mm. Um, uh, but just on the issue of cultural development, I mean, uh, th th this very um, um, incendiary topic of, of whether certain cultures are morally superior to others. I mean, I will say bluntly, yes, yes, uh, they are, but, and here's the qualification, um, because all cultures are human, uh, and because all humans are uh, somewhat sinners, no culture is perfect. Uh, there may be cultures that are have nothing to be said in favour of them, uh, but we need to be careful to assume to assume that, um, but it seems to be perfectly sensible for us to say that in certain respects, um, our culture may be uh, morally superior to another, and certainly the the um, uh, abolition, abolitionist British and Americans uh, uh, therefore were critical of societies, whether it be in West Africa or, or Brazil or the American South. Uh, where slavery was was practiced, and um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, 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 progressive folk tend to get very hot under the collar uh, uh, about such statements, which they regard as patronising or um, white supremacist or racist, uh, 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 taking a, a very critical or dismissive view of of um, uh, uh, native or indigenous cultures. But but of course, the the progressive herself. 
has very strong moral views uh, about non-progressives. So, so we're all in the business of moral judgments here, folks. Um, but, uh, but in terms of, of judging the past and judging different cultures, we have to be discriminate. Uh, so, yes, I think in this respect, that culture is uh, morally unenlightened for the following reasons. It doesn't mean everything about it is wrong. It doesn't mean everything about my culture is right. Uh, but in this respect, I, I do think uh, we are superior. I do have one question about the book that I don't think was in there, and I understand why, uh, but I'm curious. Do you think that when you encounter someone or a culture, and maybe individuals and, and cultures, broadly speaking, are different in this regard, but that if you find them at a less developed state, perhaps permitting some of the things that they do to persist longer than, than sort of now um, can be part of the process of bringing them to that. In other words, to what degree is the colonial approach to less developed civilizations uh, a model for future engagement? And to what degree was it a thing that has now passed its place and, and our way now? What, what would our way now be uh, in comparison or juxtapose. Yes, we see the colonial experience involved both the things you're talking about. So, I mean, there were debates in um, India in the 1820s uh, when the British came across the quaint Indian Hindu custom of uh, wives burning themselves alive on the funeral pyres of their deceased husbands, which the British found abhorrent and most liberal, humanist, progressive people would also find abhorrent. But the question arose, what do we do about it? And there was a debate. Um, some people wanted to simply uh, uh, ban it. Other people said, well, if you do that, you're going to provoke reaction and trouble and resentment. Uh, let's go about this more gradually. Um, now, uh, so that, that's the British having this debate. But then in comes... Um, a Hindu social reformer, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, and he says, ban it. <laughs> not, this is not the colonizer, this is the native saying, ban it. Um, and eventually they did ban it uh, in the early 1830s. And actually in this case, there was no strong reaction. But So there is a question of prudence here, because some attempts to change the world uh, can be um, um, they can be uh, um, indelicate, they can be crude, they can be uh, counterproductive. Um, but it's, it, it's, you know, when you come across what you regard as an abhorrent practice, the question is how long do you tolerate it? But uh, uh, prudence here also relates to what power you've got. And part of the point was that the British colonizers were aware of the limits of their power. And so, for example, um, um, in Zanzibar, which was a major uh, slave trading center uh, in East Africa, um, the process of the abolition of slave trading and slavery there took decades. It wasn't until the early 1900s it was finally closed down, but by incremental pressure, diplomatic pressure applied by the British. So, so yes, uh, sometimes uh, a gradual approach was used, because of the, the wise awareness of the limits of power um, and, the need, and the awareness of the need to bring people with you. Now, in terms of, of how we behave in the world today, I mean, those are good lessons to draw from the past. Um, 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 I mean, uh, we might contemplate a direct military intervention to stop something as egregious as genocide? We might. Um, uh, as, for, as for other practices, let's say in Afghanistan, uh, the maltreatment of women uh, or other practices we regard as inhumane. Well, I think if you, if you really want to change a culture, it's going to take more than 10 years. It's going to take more than 20 years. It'll take several generations. Uh, and the question then is, uh, will the indigenous people 
tolerate you being around for several generations. Well, the answer, don't assume they won't be. But again, indigenous people don't all think, think the same things. Uh, I know certainly there were some Afghans who wanted NATO and the West, the US and, and the British and the rest to stay longer in Afghanistan than we did. So I wanted to pick up on a, a theme that you mentioned of, of humility, epistemic humility about our moral knowledge. And I think that pertains to this gradualism as well. You know, do we impose and do we sort of bring our superior moral knowledge to bear in any given moment? Or do we view all of ourselves as in a process of, of growth in our learning and knowledge? And so I, I've been struck by a kind of parallel there um, between the kind of the woke, the progressives that you're describing, as well as the kind of biblicist pattern of, of evangelical or Christian thought, because both try to sort of come at the complex, messy world that calls for prudence and all this with a once for all a priori sort of moral framework. I remember you describing in colonialism, one of the kind of post-colonial uh, writers and, and or, or a whole school of, of a reading of history that was very ideological. It sort of came to every text and everything it studied already knowing what it was going to think. Um, and I'm struck by the way in which the idea that Christian theology should just be from a sort of armchair study of the Bible as, as doing something similar. Whereas I contrast, you know, the, the, the last several minutes of what you were speaking about uh, always bring to bear empirical, historical knowledge of these these many situations in order to apply Christian political prudence, and and not just Christian. You know, everything you are saying there is about the empirical common world of of history. Um, so so what I'm struck by with humility is, in my more biblicist phase, I thought that humility could best be showed by sort of just downloading and humbling oneself before, you know, the pages of scripture. I, I will only and all believe all the propositions of the scripture. But, but then I've found sort of through experience that that actually can lead to a kind of theological know-it-all. Or now I've, I've, you know, you can, you can dig through the scriptures, you can dig through the evangelical commentaries, you can dig through the systematic theologies in the space of several years of a seminary degree. It's not comprehensive, but it's it's a lot. And yet, the idea that by that point you've you've gained kind of Christian moral and ethical prudence that can be applied to everything that's actually it's 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 only the beginning. You now have sort of the biblical theological framework, but all the empirical details of the world and human nature sort of remain. Yeah. Um, does that speak to kind of your, your experience and your, your studies and pivot towards including so much history and philosophy? And your yeah, well, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, <laughs> um, those of us who want to, as it were, adopt a biblical posture toward the Bible um, need to remember the incarnation of God. Um, the wonderful thing about the Christian God is that he does not deign to maintain his uh, aloof, secure status. Mm -hmm. He takes on flesh. He enters messy human existence, mm -hmm. subjects himself to uh, all the constraints we flesh and blood human beings are subject to. Um, uh, our God did not um, hold back from getting down and dirty. And um, I can't think of any other God worth believing in, frankly. Um, and that's, you know, the doctrine of the incarnation is not, it's not written directly in the pages of scripture. Um, the doctrine of the incarnation is an inference as it were drawn from various parts of the New Testament. Um, but it's part of orthodox and evangelical theology. But note, it's not in the, it's not in the pages. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a rational inference from the pages, uh, which comprises, as it were, post-biblical theology. But if, if you take your cue from the Incarnation, then it does require you to pay attention to particulars, 
And and the thing that you know, abstractions are fine, and uh, we're, we're all comfortable with abstractions um, because they're neat and uh, because they're simple. Um, but anyone who is honest about human life knows it is neither neat nor simple. And uh, um, God in Christ uh, had the honesty to uh, face that, and we should follow him right into the messy details. Uh, so I think if one, if one is being, if one is approaching scripture in a, in a truly Christian fashion, uh, that should open you up to this kind of dialogue between what you learn from the biblical tradition and and uh, what you encounter. And the other thing is, and this is on the same line, you know, if you're if you're if you're a competent pastor, um, of course you have your your um, guidelines, and you want to uh, help people achieve uh, spiritual and moral health. And you have, in order to do that, you have to have some vision of what on earth health means here, um, for sure. Um, but the business of, of guiding uh, a, a fellow traveler in the right direction, um, given the particulars of their lives, is, is a very complicated and sensitive one. Uh, and again, you have to pay attention, you have to take the, you have to take the particular seriously. And, and one of my complaints for some long time um, about a lot of Christian theology, and I guess I began to articulate late this about 15 years ago, is you know, when, when Christian theologians and even ethicists want to grasp the world, um, too often they talk about capitalism or liberalism or colonialism. Um, and their, their understanding of what those things are is ideological, it, or at least it's it's abstract. Uh, they've learned it from books on in, in, of political philosophy. Hmm. Um, but I want to know when you say, well, first of all, in the case of liberalism, uh, I always want to ask, and we know that sometimes, particularly at the moment, some theologians, are, well, a number of theologians have been quite critical of liberalism for some long time, both uh, Protestant and Catholic. Hmm. Um, but to those people, I want to say, well, which which liberalism are you talking about? Because mm -hmm. there there are many kinds, and if if liberalism is, for example, as I think it originally was in English and American tradition, it's about the um, the uh, constraint of the power of the state by the rule of law in order to allow individuals certain freedoms. Now, if that's liberalism, I'm a liberal. In that respect, mm -hmm. uh, now that, there are other things about liberalism, depending on what you're talking about, that I might disagree with. But so there's a, there's a lack of precision about what what you're talking about here. Um, and then as for, as for colonialism, as as, as you'll you know, you'll know, King Laugh and, and Joel, have you read my book on colonialism? Um, the, 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 the kind of popular assumptions that progressive people take, and, and lots of theologians have swallowed this about it's all about white supremacism and racism and exploitation and oppression uh, as, 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 a, as an overall description, that is just not true. Hmm. Um, but, this, but most theologians don't read history. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so, it's, it's very true. I, I, it's painfully true. Uh, I was at, in a course with graduate students at Biola and they began speaking about the Black Lives Matter protests and some someone mentioned marxism and so he he goes on this spiel about marxism in this academic context and, and i just kept thinking th these people don't want to get shot that's all they want they don't they don't have any concept of what the academic definition of marxism is and so you're talking about that and and joel and i talk frequently about talking about people who aren't in the room you know the pastor who preaches about those people out there and not the yeah. people in the room. The other side of this coin, though, uh, has bedeviled me, which is that historians, you, you were dead right, historians have have not only no interest, but they they have enforced as a as a maxim of the discipline that you never speak in moral terms. 
Uh, and so there's these evangelical historians, uh, George Marsden, sort of the preeminent among them, uh, who pride themselves on talking about uh, the Great Awakenings, but never really saying whether this is the Holy Spirit, Satan, or fart. You know, they just don't have any concept of what this is. They can't speak about it. And Dr. Catherine Long wrote this book on the uh, the missionaries who went to the Walrani in Ecuador. And she writes this, this great book. She's a, a journalist. She took time. She, she sort of uh, lost her place in the university for taking so long to write this and, and writing it so well. But at the end and throughout, here you have this person who has studied this perhaps more than anyone else has or will, who will not comment on it. Who, who will not draw any any real conclusions from it. Um, and it just seems that in that way, uh, there's a false humility in the academy uh, of, of saying, well, even though I know more than anyone has or will, even though you know this is something deeply interesting to me, for me to make any comment would be to prejudice the reader. And it, it seems like it, it infantilizes the reader. Uh, you are able to state your opinion and to state the brute historical facts. And I would hope that you expect your reader to be able to tell the difference between those things. Yeah. Is there a way in which the, the Academy has tried to avoid the risk, avoid the dirt that is inherent? So, you know, when I'm, if I'm a husband, it isn't about men and women, broadly speaking, it isn't about marriage as an institution. It's knowing my wife who may differ substantially and certainly does from, from every other wife that ever has been. And so there might be things that I can draw, there might be principles, but in, in, in colonialism, there did seem to be this connection between the, the institution that provided the support, the, the, the reason for undertaking the enterprise in the first place. And just the dirty, essential work of being a part of it that we have mm -hmm. lost, maybe particularly mm -hmm. in the academy, I, I so enjoyed the voice that you have, that you are doing the work that, that, that frankly, that historians uh, uh, often don't even do. Uh, you, you have done the work of a historian. And I've read Niall Ferguson and Mark Knoll and, and others. You have done all the work they do. And then that little extra step makes all the difference. The value of your work is in that voice that you have because you not only have studied, but the process of studying has made you in the kind of person that I want to hear talk about the thing. Hmm. Well, obviously, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, on the issue of historians and, as it were, passing values of judgment I and mean, on the one hand um on the one hand it is the job of historians i think to try and give us an account of the past in the past's ter own terms to give us let's see the past as a different place uh don't please give us the past as a kind of reflection of ourselves because otherwise we learn nothing um, when I there, there's a a, um, a a film uh, I saw last year about um, one of the Bronte sisters, the, the the famous literary sisters. I forget the name now. Was it Emily? Anyway, but one of them, the, the one who wrote Wuthering Heights. Um, I think it was called Emily, and um, Wuthering Heights is a story of grand passion. And the 21st century female director um, um, thought to herself, well, you know, it's not possible for uh, Bronte to have written this book without having experienced a grand passion. So uh, the film tells the story of the grand passion that Emily must have had in order to write this book. Now, the truth is, as far as we know, she never married, never had any sexual relations. That's the truth. And yet, this book was spun out of her imagination. Now, that should make us stop and think. But no, the director made Emily into a reflection of ourselves. And I, so in one sense, you know, I, I want the historians, let's have the past in the past own terms, please. Don't intrude, uh, as it were, your own judgments 
into this account of the past. And I think up until about uh, 15, maybe 10 years ago, um, most historians attempted to do that. Um, now, the problem we now have, uh, especially in colonial history, is that uh, we have activist historians who, uh, from the get-go, uh, uh, know how they judge the colonial past, and uh, their account of the past is completely infected by their own ideological assumptions. So in that case, I'd rather, I'd rather they stopped moralizing, please, and, and hold back and, and just uh, give us a, a fair account of what happened. But it, it gets, to take a position in the middle, I mean, historians are human beings, human beings are moral beings. We're always uh, uh, um, evaluating uh, what we see. I mean, it's quite, it must be very hard, I would have thought, for an historian of the Holocaust not to express some uh, uh, um, uh, revulsion uh, of um, Auschwitz, at least in the adjectives he uses or she uses. Um, and and as, a, as an ethicist, I'm not shy in making more judgments. That's my, my job. Um, and I think, actually, historians uh, should be, as it were, upfront about what their moral prejudices are, tell the reader, and this is what I do in my own book in the introduction, I, I, in case the reader is wondering where is Bigger coming from, there's a section that tells the reader I'm a Christian, here are the relevant Christian uh, principles and views that uh, are shaping what's going to come. Uh, I'd rather historians were upfront about uh, their moral prejudices. Um, uh, and, and in a sense, but by make, by bringing the prejudices up front, it also helps the historian discipline himself, not not to allow his prejudices to distort the evidence. Um, but my, the problem is most historians, perhaps understandably, because they're, they're not trained as philosophers or ethicists or theologians, they don't know uh, how moral a lot of their language is. And they think they're being uh, simply historians. I'm talking about the progressive ones now. They claim they're just being historians, whereas uh, they're not. They're, they're being highly moralistic, but they they haven't a clue about how moralistic they are. Yeah, so it seems to me what you're doing is is not just, though, stating your prejudices. Like, you know, oh, I'm a parochial white Christian man. What can I do? Here's what I think. I'm probably going to, you know, it's something more than that. It's, it's, I'm going to, it's basically like there's a moral part of our brain. None of us can turn off. There's a philosophical part of the brain. None of us can turn off. If we never yeah. develop those, they just sort of come out by accident and then color everything. Whereas actually it's possible to discipline those parts of our psyche through, you know, philosophy, through uh, Christian theology and ethics. Yes. And that's what, you've done, you know, that's what I and King Laugh uh, aspire, aspire to do um, is, and, and it's the same as for that, that element of experience infecting theology. Like we, we can admit that this is inevitable, but that, what that actually to me that obligates us to discipline ourselves in those other areas, you know, for, for um, for a lot of your books, like there's there's a lot of moral philosophy, there's a lot of history, very clearly. Um, for me, there have been several theological questions where I came to the conclusion that the theological discourse alone is not going to help me answer this. It, it leads to the precipice of philosophical questions, and I need to go read some philosophy. And so I've been studying so, that. Um, but yeah, the, to me, the idea that we can actually discipline because if, if everybody were just the specialists, like if, if the theologians were just, you know, Bible experts, the historians were just fact experts, and nobody did that kind of integrative work, it'd be like, like nobody would be being a, a humanist, like looking at all the human phenomena, saying there's five aspects of it. There's the sociological and the philosophical and the theological, I'm, I'm making up the number five, but like, and then saying, I can't become, I can't get five PhDs, but I'm going to have to responsibly hone each of these various skills. Um, and, th and that's, that's one of the things I'm very inspired by 
in your work, but but also that um, when you, I, I see your work also as being able to enter a public debate. It's public theology, and and that's because its premises aren't just specifically Christian uh, premises. They're they're not just Bible verses that only a, a Christian would accept. Um, by speaking about that common human terrain on terms that are empirical and philosophical that anyone can sort of jump on board with, um, there, there's kind of a taking responsibility for the public square that I think um, theology often accidentally privatizes itself. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, just on that, uh, Joel, um, I mean, I, I do think that uh, I do intend that when I speak and write, I always write as a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so in one sense, I am sp always specifically Christian, but, um, um, you know, there's, and there's certain things as a Christian, I believe that only Christians believe. Sure. God in Christ. But then um, lots of non-Christians believe in God. <laughs> so so we have that in common. Uh, and then... Uh, um, um, Although, as it were, a Christian's view of human life and the world is more or less shaped by his vision of God and Christ, um, that vision doesn't always uh, radically change every aspect of, of experience. So uh, the, 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 the confessing Christian, which I, of which I'm one, uh, will find that non-Christians um, don't find everything I say to be gobbledygook. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, um, there are, you know, there, there are lots of shades of non-Christian, and um, we, should, we shouldn't presume, you know, the world's not divided into Christians and non-Christians. Yeah. The world's divided into all sorts of believer, half-believer, non-believer, anti-believer, uh, and so we shouldn't presume. So I think our, our business is to say it as we see it as Christians, um, to be as um, rational and clear about why we believe what we believe, and as it were, cast it forth and let it fall where it does. And um, we, I, I'm quite confident that there are lots of people who do not regard themselves as Christians out there that will find things that we say persuasive. Mm. Um, and who knows where that may lead. Um, so it's not a matter of, it's certainly not a matter of, but, but then I, I, I'm talking about being Christian. I'm not talking about, as it were, inhabiting Bible world and, and, and only as it was spouting Bible verses, that's not likely to win friends and influence people. Hmm. But if you, if, if you've, if, you, if you've absorbed the meaning of the Bible and become a Christian, then being a Christian, thinking as a Christian, um, um, uh, you, you think as a Christian human being and, and you have lots hmm. in common with other human beings. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's something I've been really keen on because um, I was introduced at, at the, I attended Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, Cornelius Van Til and presuppositionalism were very powerful. And the idea that Christians can and only ever should make specifically Christian arguments from premises that only Christians accept. And this struck me as a recipe for having zero things to say to an <laughs> to persuade them of anything, um, you know, to tell them which direction the gas station is. I need to start from a Bible verse. Uh, yeah. In in theory, of course, that can't work in practice. Um, and so, the idea that the, the flip side too, it, it's not that experience is as a non Christian uh, might theorize it like. There are aspects of experience um, that I think point in the direction of, of Christian theology. I've been trying to think about how um, the doctrine of sin is evident. I've heard it attributed to Chesterton and Niebuhr that its original sin is an empirically, one of the only empirically verifiable doctrines of the Christian faith. But, th but that idea mm -hmm. that, um, and, and I see it in you know some of the people you've spoken to, like Constant and Kissin of Trigonometry podcast, like people disaffected liberals 
And they're disaffected because the kind of optimistic view of human nature is something they come to reject. I mean, that, that's famously what you know, Niebuhr did to be, become a, a Christian realist is realize human nature is flawed and I see it on empirical grounds. Some of our utopian schemes are not gonna come into existence. So, so to me, I've, I've seen a path to building friendships with people who are not believers through the common ground of, you know, a, a limited view of human nature, let's say, like a, a constrained view of human nature. Um, like the, there, there's beliefs that not every non-Christian holds, but that they, some have become persuaded of, where they, yeah. I, I think clearly here of, Jordan Peterson's a very obvious example, where if you take the doctrine of sin to be something that really speaks to empirical human phenomena, I even think of Ellen de Botton of the, the School of Life, who, who talks about original sin being something he as an atheist can appropriate, and it, it actually leads him to a sort of merciful view of other people's foibles, because they're, they're built in, as it were. I, I think of Louise Perry um, of the case against the sexual revolution, writing recently about how all of what is being learned in evolutionary psychology actually sounds a lot like the doctrine of an original sin, <laughs> built-in propensities to do things that are a bit more animalistic, let's say. And so, so anyway, just to say there's, there's also this kind of a bottom-up argument from Christianity. It doesn't prove everything. It doesn't prove that Christ rose from the dead, <laughs> but no, no. It's, it's lead the way. No, no, I, I, I agree with that. And I, I just, I think um, one can be, one can have Christian integrity in all that you think and do, and still be open. Mm. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, some people uh, will be dogmatically hostile. Most people not. Uh, um, most people will be willing to meet you on, on common turf. And... Um, um, you know, if you if you meet as equals, as fellow travellers, um, and walk along with them, you may from time to time have the privilege of pointing out in the environment uh, features that they wouldn't have thought about. But mm. as a Christian, you you see, you see, um, because you've been educated by the Bible to to spot these features of human existence that others may intuit but can't articulate because they don't have the language. Mm. Um, all right, yeah. I have one question as an American speaking to a Brit about institutions. So it, it does seem that one of the, the things that occurs in America is that the people, uh, especially when they're young, have these heady ideas, a lot of isms, you know, the drunk, drunk on the isms, and then life hits and they realize that no accounting office is going to permit them to share their opinion about anarchy uh, without being terminated. And so unless you have enough money to not care what anyone thinks about you, uh, your, your sort of uh, choices are to enter into the academy where, again, there, there are plenty of restri restrictions. And, and you find at the end that you haven't really done much more than an accountant or a banker or uh, at least in America, it seems that way. Um, it seems like we lack institutions where the aristocracy and the, the sort of wage slave, however you want to think of, you know, the, the people engaged in, in modern feudalism uh, are able to speak with each other concretely with, without it just being a, a battle of the isms, without it being a, a sort of, you know, power struggle to see who doesn't get terminated. And the Academy in America is a very middle-class institution, so it doesn't really serve that purpose. The church seems like a, a promising possibility, but we're so fragmented in America. Um, there's a broad tent in Anglicanism. Does that provide uh, a, a sort of opportunity for the classes to encounter one another in a place where it is safe, let's say, or, or at least more secure? than it might be in the marketplace or might be, um, let's say, in, in private relationships? Is that something that's degraded in the UK as well? Uh, what might be a possibility or, or something you think is a promising place for that kind of engagement? Well, I think here, as, as, as in the US um, and, and in Europe, indeed, um, there is this 
uh, divide between the middle class progressive elites and uh, the people, meaning uh, working class people, um, um, and it, it, it's, it's quite a big cultural divide, and the two don't talk much, uh, and the people become populist because they feel ignored and angry. Um, uh, are we doing better with that here than elsewhere? Um, not sure. As for the Church of England, it is a broad church. It has tended to be middle class. hasn't been terribly successful in, in, in including the working class. Um, um, the other institution we have that helps to moderate conflict is the, is the BBC. But again, the BBC is run by university-educated professionals um, who might at the moment be extremely sensitive about including uh, ethnic minority voices, not so sensitive about including white working class voices. <laughs> um, but you're right, we do need institutions that bring us together. I mean, it, it does help in, in this country, we tend to walk rather than drive. So if you, so, so, so you, you, you meet other classes in the street or on the bus. Uh, whereas in, in, in the US where you are more car dependent, you, you can drive from A to B and you don't meet with people. Uh, mm. You're kind of you kind of hermetically sealed. Um, so there, there may be ways, and I, I guess maybe yes. I mean the the um, the fact that our members of parliament every Friday uh, will have a what's called a surgery in their constituency. So the the member of parliament, probably university educated, uh, gets to meet her constituents in all their glorious variety um and i i don't think your congress men and women do that quite as much i maybe i'm wrong but that, that's one place where where the the rulers the legislators get face to face with the people they're representing and it's it's a it's a it's a common practice here uh, so that that is an institution that that helps to uh, create a conversation across the 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 social and cultural divide mm. if if i might uh, we can let you go or i do have one more question i wanted to quickly ask which, so. which, yeah which is um you know as as christians and um you know at least moral conservatives in many ways in, in being involved with the academy in the us the the mentality is is often one of there's not a lot of place for us at the top. And that's how it can really feel. I, I, I think you would understand that. And, and yet, the a Central Educational Institution of British Society has highly honored you and need a place for someone to do Christian philosophy, theology, ethics. I continue to find that in, incredible as I've learned about you know Richard Swinburne and Brian Lefto, just all these wonderful ways that the British Academy is still supporting and allowing um, Christian scholarship to flourish. Could you just finally comment on that? Yeah, you and yeah I, I think, I th yeah, I think you, I think you're, you're, you're right, Joel. Um, uh, the, the um, progressive prejudice is not as strong here in our universities as in some universities in the States. I'm thinking of, you know, the likes of Harvard. Um, also, um, our traditional universities often will have departments of theology, mm. um, partly because certainly in Oxford, you know, there was a time when the university was Anglican and um, um, in fact, all the members had to be, most of the dons had to be Anglican priests. Um, and we don't, we don't have a tradition of, of strict church-state separation so Christian theology, whether in Oxford, Cambridge, or Durham, um, as distinct from religious studies, hmm. uh, does flourish as Christian theology, uh, and it's 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 not subject to to any strong hostility. I don't think. Um, 
uh, and in, in general, the 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 um, the political temper is a bit more liberal. Uh, Oxford is better than some places. Mm. Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I've been quite as explicitly conservative when I applied for my post. I'm not sure I've got it. I I developed that when, when I was in post, but I survived. Um, mm -hmm. My colleagues, my colleagues still speak to me. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, yes, I mean, it's it's from our from our side, we have problems, but it's it's not irredeemable. Uh, so there is hope. There's hope. Well, I I appreciate that, and I think there's no reason to take a more pessimistic view than is absolutely necessary. So we're 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 we're, we're called not to. <laughs> Amen. Hope is a theological virtue. Well, thank you, Dr. Bigger, for your time, and. Uh, uh, more questions that are on my mind, but uh, we could even uh, speak or I could email you future questions. But thank you for the time sure. you've, you've given us. And uh, Not at all. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, King Laugh. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing you in the flesh sometime. And uh, Joel, uh, thanks. This has been an interesting conversation. The topics have been important ones. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't get to... Uh, Bard versus Bruner, or uh, and any of the other things I have on my mind, but oh, again, next ne next time <laughs> sounds wonderful. Absolutely, this has been the Flanner and the Philosopher, Dr. Nigel Bigger. Goodbye for now.